Hi, okay, so today is June 10th, 2011, and I just um, recently read some articles about the Linux desktop, and I um, just want to comment on just a few things that are out there that are, that are being said, and um, I hope to approach this in the same way I usually do, is just try to honestly respond, you know, to various things that are out there, and at least from my view, some perceptions or misperceptions, or misdirections, and or good things that are being said, or things I disagree with, etc., etc., pretty much an editorial, okay? Um, now, the, I've said this a bunch of times in my presentation, but basically what I'm I've been trying to, you know, use Linux fully in um, my work environment for about 10 years. And, um, of course, when I say, make a blanket statement like that, of course, it, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It all really depends on the, um, the, the end user's needs. It dictates whether Linux is a viable option or not. And of course, when you're, you know, in a business environment that has specific tasks they have to accomplish in specific ways, then they're going to need, they may or may not need specific tools to accomplish those tasks. So, you know, I, I understand that. So, for some people, a Linux desktop can be very, very viable, very usable. And um, those are people that primarily surf the web, play games, use their email, and watch videos. But Linux is a perfectly viable, you know, option for people that are that just do those things. Um, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get Linux to to be able to accomplish more. And, and the last set of presentations I did, I, I don't know if I was clear for the, the overall message that I was trying to get across, and that was that there are two types of barriers to the end users that are out there right now. One type is the barrier because it's not yet possible to do, and the other type of barrier is some kind of inconvenience or error that takes place that affects the user's ability to do what otherwise should be able to be done. Um, and, you know, just for example, if we were, where one distribution was able to say access my Haiku partition, you know, it's just an example. It's it's a pretty specific specific example. It's not going to be common to a lot of people, but it's an example. Um, another one couldn't out of the box, or, or some required tweaking or whatever steps to tweak things to get things to work and I, I'm just you know I'm just one person I'm not saying that the way I have it set up is the only way to do it but I, I'm just a sample my my choices are just a sample of all the things out there and if you have just a sample you can get a you can get a picture of what some other user might come across as like an overall percentage or get a feel for what another person might come across even if they have completely different requirements than I have or desires and a desirement does desire is a better word than I have uh, so that that was the purpose was to show what, what did I have to do what what effect did, would my distribution choice have on my ability to um, do what I want to do with the system and I, I was able, at the end of the exercise, to come up with, at least in my own mind, my list of what was the best choice, second best choice, third, fourth, and all the way down. I threw Haiku in there, and you know, it's not Haiku is not Linux, but you know, I threw it in there just to because they are in development, and you know, just trying to give them feedback. Um, obviously, you know, again, I'm going to say this again. I hopefully I made it clear in my other presentation. I know it's, I know it's alpha software. You know, it's not really you know, desirable to come by when before something's done and, and, and start critiquing it as if it were supposed to be finished. I, I don't treat it that way. I'm more like, it's feedback. All this is feedback. All this is supposed to be feedback. 
And so my point, my point is, is from all these different distributions, it's clear to me that, that, that some of them have actual barriers that, that aren't there otherwise in other distributions with the same Linux kernel. It's just the environment itself is causing the end user, in my case, problems in one where the problem doesn't exist in the other. In each one of these problems that take place in one or the other or the other is the obstacle that the user would have to go through if that were his distribution of choice. And so far there aren't any, there are, there are no distributions out there that I, that I try that are on my system here as a test system that I can say that as soon as I was done installing it, it did everything I wanted to and it was very easy for me to correct. None of them. Um, that's pretty much the state of Linux, and some were better and some were worse. At least in my eyes, it, it letting me do what I want to do. Um, and then I also have some definite opinions as to what's <laughs> what's the best way to go. <laughs> in, in any window environment that looks like KDE three, the closer you get to that, the better I think it is. That's just my opinion. Okay. Um, Okay, I'll stop with that. Now, there were a couple things I I was just looking, and someone who recently, I guess his name is Matt Hartley, recently wrote an article, How's the Linux Desktop Doing? This is on June 7th, 2011. Today's 10th, it was three days ago. And after reading the whole thing, I... Yeah, okay, I'll first make an overall overview comment. And that is, unless someone's going to write a book, uh, there's no way in hell anybody could really capture a good. I mean, it's not a criticism. This is. I'm trying to actually show some understanding here. That um, you know, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to point out a few exceptions. But obviously, the guy could have written another paragraph, another page. It isn't an article anymore. It's a, it's a book. And so I could probably understand why certain things weren't mes mentioned, and maybe he just used, picked a few things as an example. I, you know, I understand that, but I'm still going to point some things out because I think in the overall picture, um, for people in general, it doesn't really show much. If you want to see how the Linux desktop was doing, watch my last four videos. It's really what my opinion is, uh, just from the perspective of one person. And the answer to that really is it, it depends. At least to my mind. So, you know, if um, in the case of Fedora, if you wanted your updates or you want to install anything, the Linux, Linux desktop is doing horribly. Um, in the case of Mandrake, if you want to use Firefox 4 with WebGL, it's not doing very well. Um, in the case of Ubuntu, if you want to be able to log in to the graphical user interface's root or use SU instead of sudo, it's not doing too well. These are all little small things, but whatever. Um, it all depends on what the user's requirements really is to be able to answer this question, but in an overall sense, it's not doing well at all. And in the first paragraph, he goes into, um, you know, he says, how many times have we as desktop Linux users been asked if this is the year of the desktop? Too many times, I imagine. Even worse, we still calculate the value. Okay, so he goes in this thing about calculations. Now, I'm not all that interested in, I'm more interested in usability than I am in calculations, because I think once the usability is there, the calculations will fall into place. Um, we'll just know. You know, you know, I just look, you know, just take a look around you. You can see there aren't a lot of desks with Linux on it. You meet, you know, I've met one person just randomly that happened to have uh, an older version of Ubuntu on his laptop that actually encouraged me to actually try it. Uh, the name kind of scared me away, and the idea that it was had a Debian backend, I'll be honest, it scared me away because um, why the name? Because Ubuntu doesn't mean anything to me. It sounds like it's maybe a word, you know, you know, I get the idea it has something to do with Africa and then I, I get the idea that maybe they're trying to be what do you call it? Over, um, I shouldn't get into this too much, overly um, 
politically correct or, or something like that, and and that kind of gives me the the feel that maybe this is going to turn out like Fedora. Well, it didn't. I was very impressed and pleased with with Ubuntu so far. At least it's the best they got out there. You know, again, I don't really, I'm not really too favorable about GNOME, but you know, whatever. You know, beggars can't <laughs> beggars can't be choosers. I mean, at least I could do most anything I wanted to do, or at least I knew I could reach the limit of what can be done in this Ubuntu environment, and that's what's important, at least for my purposes. But, um, you know, once once you have everything reasonably easy, you can reasonably easily accomplish what you want to accomplish, the percentages are just going to go up. I mean, it's almost self-explanatory that, you know, as a Linux user, if it takes too much time to research or too much time to configure something or it's something you know that a normal, normal person that just sees their computer as a tool rather than something to mold into a better tool for their own use um, is not going to do, such as command line or edit a configuration file, then, you know, it's not really going to be there yet. That's really the standard that, uh, you know, to target Linux for the desktop, uh, that's really the standard you have to have. Is it just going to work? I don't expect, uh, I don't expect uh, <laughs> to stick my Ubuntu disk in the DVD drive and suddenly every printer that's networked and connected to my computer is going to have all the proper drivers installed. I don't, don't expect that much, although I actually do think it's feasibly possible. Um, uh, technically possible, but not feasibly possible. Um, I do think within reason having things work amongst a modern expectation, and a modern expectation involves a graphical user interface. I've already gone through the, I've already gone over the whole corundum with the graphical user interface. If the underbelly keeps changing, then you might as well not make a graphical user interface till such time that you know the underbelly is not going to change. So, for example, if I make a graphical user interface that's going to add a file system tab entry to FS tab so it mounts my Samba shares, and then two years later, all of a sudden, SIFS is depreciated, then, you know, it's not worth making the GUI. You know, the idea is to build upon, but, I'm, you know, I'm digressing. I had a whole presentation on that. So... I'm not really okay. So getting back to this article, I'm not really interested in the numbers right now. I'm not saying I don't care about them. I certainly do care about the numbers. I want as many people as possible to use Linux. But I know you don't have to tell me. You don't have to release a survey. You don't have to give me a report. I know it's not going to be there. I know it's not going to you know. You know. <laughs> Once it's fully usable, then I might be interested. But before that, I'm not. It's it's the cart before the horse, at least in my opinion. Okay. The next thing he goes, next point he goes on to make, he says, well, Ubuntu doesn't represent Linux. Well, based on my recent experience, it is, and it's the most well-known of the fully functional Linuxes out there. Um, I'm gonna just spell it out right now. The 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 distributions of Linux that I feel are fully functional include Ubuntu and Linux Mint and SUSE is close if they could just get as many applications to work in it, including the GUVC viewer. Okay? And that's still with me remembering in mind that um, <laughs> my GUVC viewer isn't even working in SUSE properly right now. It all comes up with sound and a garbled mess on the screen I've seen in my uh, SUSE Linux for Dummies presentations that I'm going to keep there to show that just because you got st something to work once ain't gonna, it doesn't mean it's going to work again in Linux and that, that has to be corrected. Um, so yes, there are other distributions for Linux, but that diversity of just the distribution to me is a bad thing. The diversity, because he goes, the point he makes is that well, these distributions, these distributions, the fact that someone could pick Ubuntu and someone could pick 
the idea is right. Some could pick Fedora, some could pick Mandrake. The idea is right, but to me, it's more in the in, in that diversity should more be in the apps the user chooses and perhaps the window environment, not just the district. I think each distribution should be able to do everything all the other di distributions are able to do. I'll say that right now. Um, but whether Ubuntu decides to use GNOME as the default desktop, and Fedora may decide to use you know, you know, F XFCED, and SUSE, SUSE default is KDE. Okay, that's you know their their their, their supported de environment. Um, that's the diversity. But if someone wants to roll with GNOME and SUSE, they should be able to do it just as just as well. Um, so, but that's not much of a strength. I mean, that is a strength, but it doesn't overcome the usability barrier. You have to have the usability barrier to camp, uh, to cross before the before that diversity strength can count for anything. Because if you can't use it, it doesn't matter how diverse it is. Um, then he goes to talk about peripheral compatibility, and I, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of agree and disagree in, in some ways. Um, ever since I've been using... Now, ba back in the earlier days, i say the early 2000s, if you wanted to use something like a Logitech camera, like I'm doing now, you know, the presentation I did is, I said, hi, just stick this thing in the USB drive and get GVC viewer and you're done. And make sure you, you select... This uh, this audio device HW one comma zero and you're done. <laughs> you know maybe I said what apps to install and that was it for the presentation and that's all you need to know. Well, back in around 2000 or 2003 at that time, you'd actually have to mod probe the driver for the device you wanted to use. It wouldn't just load, and so you'd have to type go to the command line, type mod probe, whatever device it is, and then then on top of that you'd also have to install some software to control it. And back then, I mean the best program out there was XAW TV and I'm not even sure if it had audio. It may or may not have had audio at the time. L U V C viewer, I don't remember being out there and I searched pretty extensively for it. Um, I certainly don't remember YouTube being around to be able to load stuff up. That yeah, I'm talking about peripherals, scanners. I don't remember if I even tried to hook a scanner up, but from the post I read from people that are trying to use it, it seemed like it was ridiculously difficult. Um, handspring visors, yeah, you can sync, but you had to do some magic underneath the hood. So, yeah. So as far as peripherals are concerned, uh, <coughs> it's gotten better in, in user space. Now, the question is whether back in 2002 and 2003, uh, the capability was already there. And I'm, I may be misremembering. I, note, note, or not that, note that I'm not saying that, you know, I was using kernel 2.4.2.6. Memory escapes me. As to whether the mod probing of drivers was necessary in kernel 2.2, I'm sorry, kernel 2.4, or kernel 2.6, I showed up in the kernel 2.4 stage. And I do know that some drivers were between kernel 2.2 and 2.4 because um, Caldera had a netware file system driver that they had released the source for, and I tried to compile it against 2. Four. It was made for two two. I could probably against two four. It didn't work. But again, I'm digressing. So we're talking about peripherals here. Um, so it's a good thing that we can plug a lot of our devices in and use them. But the question is, what kind of front ends are we coming across to be able to use these things? Um, I'd say that it's very difficult for a new user to know. An example of a camera. I could speak of it because I have it here. 
um, well, back up. In some, for some devices, such as cameras, it's hard for a, an end user to know what front end to use. On other devices, you don't really need a front end. So, for example, say this one terabyte iOmega, you know, storage device here. I don't even know anything to use it in Linux. I just plug the thing in and within 10 seconds a window will pop up and I'll see the contents of my hard disk right there. I could write to it, hey, I could save files to it, and I could delete files from it, and I could just copy the contents of it. Same thing with my Motorola Droid, I just need to put turn USB storage on and it works. Same things in Windows. So when those for USB storage devices support is very good, Linux desktop area. For cameras, I would say we need we need some work on the front ends, and I'm not counting GVC Viewer uh, as needing work. I mean, the only critique I can have for it right now is maybe it can get a better, little bit of a better look to it. But goddamn, don't 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 pass up on a, a, a patch or an update to make yourself compatible with the library for a goddamn icon. I can care less. I'd rather have the functionality than, and so far it's doing fairly well right now. So I will agree with him mostly that peripherals compatibility is better, but in some cases, and uh, perhaps such as in scanners, um, it's we're not really there yet, and it mostly has to do with the front end. I think actual drivers cells are good and there's just you know the difference between Windows and Linux is there's a separation between the driver and the front end you know um, you know you can plug your camera in and you can have all the under underbelly tools that, uh, that allow it to function to be able to accept input of audio and video images and send the signal to a file on the hard disk but whether the software that you know, you pick what kind of, you know, encoding you want, what kind of focus, what kind of shape, you you know, effects you might want on the on the picture. That happens on the front end. Um, okay. The next one, software is available. In my opinion, where he says software is available, um, it's a no. Not in all cases. In some cases, yeah. And that case is Ubuntu, and that case is Debian, and that's the that's on the backbone of all the maintainers of the Debian project that are well organized. And you've got an app, you know, there's one person picks an app and he's the maintainer, and that's it. Another person picks another app, he's the maintainer, and once it stabilizes, they move it into the into the main line, and that's that's the way it is. So you got a conservative back end here, and so things are going to run nicely when you fancy it up for a desktop user. <coughs> now, <coughs> but I don't agree with his overall point where he says software is available. And the one thing, the author pretends that the special apps that people need in certain circumstances, such as tax software that he mentions here, um, or maybe a special engineering program that analyzes the impacts of crashes or failure points in pipes or whatever other industry specialized apps that are out there. Um, they aren't legacy apps. They're the apps that, that people need. And he, he pretends that somehow engineers or tax preparers are just going to be able to, if they just give up their tax software, they just give up their trial balance or, or their, their write-up software, or the engineers just give up their, you know, he, he doesn't even think about these things. He just thinks that all the apps are, every app that's ever needed is there. It's not. Um, he, he pretends that it's just a matter of people not wanting to use these different apps. It's not the case at all. Um, they're actually, it's, so, and he calls them legacy applications. I'm sorry when, you know, next year when ProSystem comes out with their uh, 2011 tax prep software that's 
hot off the press, it sure as hell ain't a legacy app. <laughs> it, it's the app that, you know, one-third to two-third of the accounting industry in the United States is using to prepare their taxes with. Um, one-third to one-half is a better estimate. So, it's the Linux desktop may be doing okay in a lot of ways. But this, you say the software is available, but if someone were to try um, Cheese to do their Logitech video camera presentations, they would quickly find out that Cheese isn't capturing the sound. They wouldn't know what the hell to do about it. Um, if they if they think they're being smart by taking advantage of Ubuntu's LTS support for three years and they're still using Ubuntu 904 and they try to install an HP lit printer on their network, they ain't gonna have any fucking luck. And the reason why they're not gonna have any luck is because HP lip needs a new environment to run. It's that simple. Yes, the software is available, but you actually have to understand um, which one of all the softwares that are out there is the right one to use for one and for two you have to have the right parameters you know for example in SUSE Linux 11.4 GUVC viewer is the way to go 11.5 it's crap so when you upgrade it's so we've got that we got this kind of inconsistency on the one hand if you don't upgrade you won't be able to use certain things but on the other hand if you do upgrade to enable yourself to use a certain subset of things the other su subset of things you want to use it won't be available so that is the problem and so you, the blanket statement it's over it's an oversimplified statement to say the software is available for one but for two, to try to say that the software is available when there are a lot of specialized apps that are out there uh, in many industries um, that allow these professionals to do what they do in their profession uh, that aren't available, it's a complete misnomer. I think the cloud is a cop-out. I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. The cloud is a complete and absolute cop-out. Um, it's saying we give up and let's just wait until Google comes to our rescue. Well, I haven't been impressed that impressed, first of all, with the apps that have come out of Google. Um, the, the one application yet so far that runs in the cloud that so far that I've been impressed with is Angry Birds. Um, I'd probably do a sh short little demo on just how to use that in, uh, in Ubuntu because it, it works. I tried it the other day. It's supposed to only work in, it advertises only being able to work in Chrome, but it works in Firefox. Um, I saw someone make a post about that and I checked and, and indeed it does work. Um, so, yeah, um, I think there is a web based application for tax cut. But again, we're you know we're doing very comp in the accounting industry. We're doing one complicated returns. I'm not saying that the web-based version of tax cut isn't. I haven't looked at it. I can't speak for it. Whether it's going to have the ability to do to the level of complexity that we may need for some of our clients. But the second thing is is really client confidentiality, and I'm very hesitant to put anything any client data at all out of our hands because we're responsible we're responsible to keep it confidential and to put it up there on the internet you know unless the client knows knows they're putting it up on the internet I I'm not comfortable with it at all um, at least the I want I want the client to inherently know what the risks are too before um, you know there's not the data is not just in our control in our control if, if uh, you know the web app is used if we ever do that and I wouldn't want to have it buried in some you know <laughs> five page long contract terms of service you know at the bottom and they're just stuck with it and they have another choice I want you know 
are trying to one to have a choice whether it's okay with them that uh, the security of the, the the security of their data is in someone else's hands they've never met, and two, um, well, that's it. One and, and the possibility, I guess, websites can get hacked or whatever. Um, Okay, so he goes now. He goes to the next part. And he talks about familiarity and usability. <coughs> At this point, he, he starts to criticize the the prospective end users. And he says, "Well, do, it doesn't work like he he acts like they're dumb. He acts like well, if it doesn't work like Windows or Mac OS X, and that simple kind of viewpoint." Then they're rejecting. They are rejecting it stupidly. No, I don't think so. I mean, if I look at my Ubuntu desktop, it, it's it's functional enough for no. You know, it's functional enough that you can get used to the differences between what was in, say, Windows. And or, or Mac OS X. I, I haven't used Mac OS X enough, so I won't speak for it, but I will speak for Windows. And, you know, that the Xbox is on the left and, and not on the right hand side is not a big deal, and you get used to it after a while. It may feel unusual for a little bit, but it certainly isn't going to be a reason for me to, to reject what I'm doing here. Um, that the menu bar is at the top and not the bottom. Those th those aren't really problems. When you get to something like XFCE, where you have absolutely no guidance, you have a little mouse pointer, and if you just happen to right-click on the desktop to find that you have menu selections, <laughs> okay, um, that is completely unintuitive, and that's what the problem. That's a problem. Now, for most people, they have. Um, they're going to try something like Ubuntu. They're going to try SUSE. But a lot of people are going to end up trying Fedora. And Fedora won't even have these problems, supposedly, he's been pointing out. Um, I don't think that the fact that the little Xbox here is on the left instead of the right, is in Windows, or the menu bar is on the top, is any reason anybody's going to say it's unusable. I think it's a misplaced argument. Um, Now he says there might be some users that might still be on the fence due to their inability to get past the issues described above. The usability, or the real usability issues, are not just that the end product happens to have a different feel to it. You restart your computer from the upper right instead of the bottom left in Ubuntu's GNOME environment. It's more like <coughs> Say you want to access, um, you know, shares or that are on a Windows and/or Samba server. Well, you got to know the command line, or you have to know the file system tab entry to do that. It isn't just going to happen, at least in GNOME. Now, in KDE, you have a shot, and so you have like a 60% shot. 60% of the time, the distribution will set it up right. So where after you install KDE, you can click on my computer, and you can click on network, and you can dig down to the Samba shares. Although the shares won't be mounted, you will see them as browsable. And you'll be able to copy and paste files to them, and, and even if you open up a file that's on those unmapped shares with an app, it'll save a temporary file in the temp folder, and it will pipe it back when you save the file to the correct place. Um, I've done that before. I know that works at least in KDE 3. And no, no, you don't have that at all. As far as I know, maybe some special app for web browsing, but it doesn't come out of the box, so it isn't clear to people. They think they may be under the impression that there's no way to mount shares in the Samba server. They may not even try or ask. Okay. 
And then he declares Linux is ready for most people. And I'm just going to argue with that till I turn blue in the face. And I said, but I'm going to say the main reason is not the application barrier. Because again, I'm talking about, I speak mostly for the accounting industry in the United States. Somewhat for some of the other accounting industries in other English speaking countries. You know, <laughs> various people here and there around the world have tried to get Caseware to run in wine. And they haven't found it, that it worked. Caseware is a very powerful tool, and no one wants to. There's, it does so much for you, it makes no sense to give it up. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a reason to use Windows. Um, but it's not ready for most users. Certainly Fedora is not. Fedora 15 is not ready at all. Fedora 15 gave up its graphical user interface so easily. And there's I am when I've done when I've searched for the errors that have come up in logs, I've absolutely have seen no guidance whatsoever to get it to work. That if I happen to find a solution, I may just be the first person to have figured out how to fix that fuck up. There are two people uh, on, um, yeah, I'd say one at least, maybe two different people that have asked questions about the problem that I've come across, and and their answer was to reinstall. That is isn't right. I happen to have the luxury of having other partitions that could access the Fedora partition and let me edit the files with the graphical user interface. It still costs me the time of a reboot. I've spent maybe half an hour trying to solve the problem already. And since it only takes an hour to install Fedora, and the only thing I got in there is a menu list file and nothing else, I'm probably going to reinstall Fedora and absolutely do nothing with it. Fedora is not ready. And if Fedora represents 20% of the Linux distribution installations out there, we got a big problem. Um, Ubuntu is not, you can't make a blanket statement, or even a general statement, that's, that Linux is ready for most people until such time that problems that arise, such as the ones I point out in these various presentations, are rare, or rare at best, not commonplace. Again, I'm sitting here from the experience that I could say every one of the, the distributions that I have installed in here between Slackware, Red Hat, Mandriva, SUSE, Ubuntu, and Mint, they all have their different usability problems. All of them, for one off the top of the head, is mounting, top of my head, is mounting network share. If you want to integrate that with one, you forget it. It's not going to work from the KDE browser. You have to have... Um, you have to mount the share, then you have to assign a drive letter in Wine to the share, so otherwise it's not going to work for the apps there, at least in Wine. Um, <coughs> so, so no. Does Linux desktop have a value? Certainly does, but no, Linux is not ready for most people. Linux is, as I just said, not ready for most people. There's a very small slice of people that can use it with very limited needs, and those needs could have been filled back um, just as well back in 2000 or 2001 when I first started using Linux as now. The, the set of people that can use Linux has not grown an inch since 2001, and I'll say that with conviction. And that set is email, browsing the web, The only, the only, actually, the only thing it's really grown in is the ability to watch videos on YouTube. But YouTube hadn't been invented yet. Yeah, you know, Flash wasn't very prominent yet. Um, now he he proposes some solutions here that I think are just outrageously ridiculous, <laughs> and I think. Um, the proposals are just, just or just demonstration of how a, a subset of the Linux community is completely out of touch with the reality of the simple requirement of end user needs. So, 
that's what I look for. Again, when I'm talking about you know, the Xboxes, you know, is one example. The Xbox is on the left and on the right. That's not a usability issue. That's a familiarity issue. But if this little box here had no X on it, then I had to do click on my mouse, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, to get it to close, but there was nothing written on there to let me know that, such as an XFCE, that would be a usability issue. Okay, so, so let's look at my want versus solution list for guidance. Everything should be working right out of the box. Solution, buy Linux pre-installed by using your search engine to find the right vendor. Well, I have a couple comments about there out there. Number one, there hardly is there hardly are any Linux desktops out there that are sold with excuse me, with Linux pre installed. That's number one. Number two, if you do get it with supposedly Linux pre installed, at least in one instance, the one example where I supposedly had bought that with came with Mandrake, this little round computer over here that I did my floppy disk presentation on. It didn't come pre-installed, I had installed myself. Two, next point. In a year after you get your system with pre-installed Linux on it, um, suddenly your repositories start disappearing. Ah, really? Yes, yes they do. And after three years, at most, you won't be able to install any apps. You won't be able to keep up with the new updates, and you won't have, you know, and then when you go to install the next Linux, guess what? Something like what happened between my OpenSUSE 11.4 and 11.5 will take place. Something that was compatible before will no longer be compatible. Three. Just because Ubuntu ships on the computer first doesn't mean that when I stick my Logitech camera into the USB drive, that when I double click on the GeoVC View application, if I'm able to get it installed, and that's only in the Debian based distribution so far, without having to compile it, and I'm talking about real, you know, real end users that just want to point and click and use their damn computer and not mess with anything, that won't work for them. It may or may not work between upgrades. It may or may not work for the peripherals. So getting Linux pre-installed isn't a solution. No one ships a computer with a Logitech camera and an iOmega driver first and your monitor with it. No one. Well, the monitor, yeah. Um, all the special apps you want to use. It doesn't, you know, it's going to ship with the cert like I have here. Which was a which Dossier, with Dossier Me has been a very good solution for one of our needs here. Um, next, want Office Suite and Tax software made available with the same brands as used before. That's not a, that's not the want. The want is that the damn thing <coughs> works the same way. For example, you know if I go into LibreOffice, and I find that the way my the way um, the word processor works is that it has generally, you know, the file menu things where I would expect them to be, they happen to relearn them as they did with Office 2007. I'd rather use OpenOffice, even though it's not the brand name, if and only if. You can do all the things that the other thing can do, or when someone sends me a Word document, I open it up, it doesn't look like a piece of crap. Okay? It's nothing to do with it. Tax software, there isn't any. I know. <laughs> I was working on a project that at least accomplished getting a 1040EZ filled out, but that's it. And it stopped there. There's no more. There isn't a tax app. If, there, if you're talking about the cloud, well, it's a different story, and it may be functional enough to do what you want to do. Maybe between Intuit and Tax Cut, it may be that's how you do it. But again, your data is in the hands of somebody else, and for you know accounting professionals, <coughs> you know, with it at the end of the day, we're responsible. We're responsible to keep our clients' data confidential. 
um, and whether whether we in fact actually have some control of what happens to the data, be able to access it later, um, if we need to to amend it, um, which things that are in the cloud poof away after a couple of years. Um, <laughs> Try getting some of your bank statements from three years ago from the cloud and see what happens. Um, it's not really optimal. The optimal thing is to be able to have a tax program that can install, keep the client data on your system, password protected, in a proprietary format that someone can't come along and just read if it were text. And under you, the end user's control, at least, at least that way. Um, yeah, in that case, the proprietary format is protection. So it's not a matter of just learning to use LibreOffice, like as if it were just as good. Uh, the, you know, everybody that's rated OpenOffice or LibreOffice against Microsoft Office give it lower ratings. It's that simple. They want something just as good. It works just as well. And it's not about familiarity. It's about usability and it's everything I've explained. So I'm done with that part. <clears throat> now I'm just gonna discuss something. I, I was I ran across um, there was a article that was written December of 09 and apparently they had some conference calls with whom I don't know. And I don't know how it would work if you have thousands of people calling a single phone number and trying to talk over each other. But these were all the different dates here that the Linux Foundation tried to have a conversation about the things, some of the things I had brought up. You know, what are the barriers that in independent software vendors face importing applications? These were all good things, but I don't know if handling a software call with a conference call was the best way to do it. I also really wonder how seriously this is taken. I tried to look at the at the the assessment survey, and I don't know. Maybe I was under the wrong impression that this would be actually be the results of the survey. Uh, maybe it's just a way to take the survey. Therefore, the link didn't work. But it didn't seem like you know if that's the report, they don't really take this seriously. It's a dead dead link. Um, or the last time the survey was done in 06. Well, you know, by now, they should, by now, if the Linux Foundation had enough clout to, or input to, or they were going in the right direction to actually get somewhere and were able to implement it, it would have been implemented by now. So I, I don't understand why either the Linux Foundation is going completely in the wrong direction or this was just something went wrong with the implementation or people just don't want to, the developers developers just aren't listening to the feedback I don't know or maybe the feedback is hidden somewhere that no one knows where to find it and no one keeps it in mind or maybe it's just too hard to implement and there's this there's another article it says the week of the Linux desktop debate <coughs> and this was written God back in 08 and basically it's a complaint about how some writers decided to go out there and declaring Linux, you know, this is the year of the Linux desktop, and it's kind of like a, it's a bit of a backlash against people just coming in and and just deciding to declare on behalf of Linux itself that's the year of the desktop and Linux doesn't necessarily what the Linux Foundation I guess doesn't necessarily declare it's ready or they dance around it um, it never seems to fail this time of the year brings out predictions and within the debate about the future of Linux especially the desktop it's a good sign that we go through this back and forth that shows the widened device community of users and pundits to feel blah 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 so this week, dozen articles and posts appeared. Start with Fast Company. And now I don't know. It's not clear from this article, but it's, uh, there's some quotes here saying, 
As I wrote recently, we already have the Linux desktop. It runs the cloud. It's called Google and Facebook. Now, I guess she has a problem with the argument. I guess it's her responding to it. Um... These things seem to be all true. She just kind of mentions what's going on, but doesn't really editorialize on it, I guess. Um, it's not really much to say about that article. I don't know why I brought it up. <coughs> so, anyway. I guess I'll just uh, stop here for a second, cause I'm, and I'll do two small presentations.